Hello, in this video, I'm going to tell you about the internal defenses of the innate immune system. Um, so our internal defenses are the second line of defense if the external defenses have been breached. So if a pathogen makes it through our external defenses, so like skin and mucous membrane and so on, uh, then we've got our internal defenses that take over in this fight against the pathogen. Uh, now, I want to clarify that it's still innate immunity. So these are still the responses that are present in all of us that are not adaptive. These are not developed over time. We are born with these innate defenses. Um, so our internal innate defenses include antimicrobial substances, Basically, I mean lysozyme, so lysol enzyme, like an antibacterial enzyme that kills all kinds of bacteria. Um, and then also phagocytes, natural killer cells, inflammation, and fever, which is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this video. So phagocytes are like big Pac-Man cells. They're just these big cells that go around gobbling stuff up and they digest stuff and do away with it. Um, so in some cases, they will actually ingest microbes, pathogens, things like that, and they'll actually kill them and destroy them and they're gone. Um, but they also will kill our dead cells. So like cells that have been killed uh, by injury or damage or by fighting infection, so they'll kill, they'll destroy our old cellular debris. They'll get rid of it, clean it up. Um, they also can uh, clean up things like splinters, uh, as long as the splinter is something of organic material. So like a wood splinter, for example, let's say you got a wood splinter, you can't quite get it out. Um, that's okay, because the phagocytes will actually go and dissolve that wood away. It won't be there forever. Your, your phagocytes will clean it up. Um, if it's something like a metal splinter that's inorganic, then that's going to stick around. So you got to work harder on getting that out because your phagocytes won't be able to dissolve that. Uh, natural killer cells. Now, these are immune cells, but they are still part of our innate immunity, meaning that they are not adaptive. They're not specific. They can kill all sorts of different things, um, including our own abnormal cells. So these can target all sorts of different microbes, but really their claim to fame is in preventing tumors from growing in your body. Um, so... They are on patrol. What happens if a tumor forms is we've got our cells in our body all have a pre-programmed time that they're supposed to die. So that's different for all different cells, depending on their jobs and wear and tear and what they do. So like some cells might only last 90 days, other cells might last 20 years, but all of our cells are destined to die at a certain time based on what type of cell it is. And those instructions are in our DNA. So all the different cells are supposed to die at the right time. Sometimes a cell will sort of go rogue and stay alive when it was supposed to die. So it'll just kind of keep going and be like, forget it, I'm not gonna die even though my DNA says I'm supposed to, and they'll just keep going. So that's an abnormal cell. And if that cell starts to replicate and make more like it, that's when we have a tumor that's forming. So it's really a collection of these abnormal cells that aren't listening or, or following the instructions in the DNA. So one of the important jobs is na of natural killers is to be on patrol and kill those abnormal cells before they have a chance to start making more like themselves and create a tumor. Um, so it's really important. So when cancer does happen, if a tumor does form, it's one of two things. It's very uncommon, but it could be that it's an immune deficiency. So if there's a problem with the natural killer cells and they're not on patrol like they're supposed to be, then it could be that an abnormal cell gets by and they don't kill it because maybe there just weren't enough. That's not common. Usually what happens is we're exposed to some type of carcinogen. So something that is cancer causing, what that means is it's causing more cells to become abnormal. So even if our natural killers are doing a great job and they're out in full force and they're on patrol and they're killing and killing and killing any abnormal cells that pop up, if we're exposed to a carcinogen that's now causing way more cells to become abnormal, it only takes one to make it through to and not get caught by a natural killer so that then it can 
can um, create more of itself and form a tumor. So that's more often what's going on. So that's why we want to avoid known carcinogens like too much UV sunlight or smoking, things that we know leads to cancer. It's because those are things that we know causes these cells to go rogue. And if that's happening faster than the natural killers can kill them, that's when cancer can happen. <clears throat> All right, so the way they actually work is if we look in our picture here, let's say this is the enemy cell. So that could be like a microbe or a pathogen, or it could be our own abnormal cell, whatever it is. Um, then the natural killer comes along and it shoots out these proteins called perforins. Think about like perforation. It's perforating the cell membrane of the enemy. So it's poking holes in the cell membrane. Then it sends out this enzyme called granzymes. Whoops, didn't mean to click sends out granzymes, which are sort of like little chemical grenades. So first it pokes holes in the cell membrane, and then it puts all these grenades into those holes. So now we've got granzymes that are going inside the enemy cell, and it sort of dissolves it from within to kill the cell. And then the natural killer just moves on. It goes about its day and moves on to the next thing. And now we've just got this dead cell left behind. It's not gonna cause any trouble because it's dead. Um, and then when we have any kind of phagocyte or a big Pac-Man cell, we'll find it and just clean it up. It'll just be old cellular debris. It'll clean up and it'll be like it never happened. That's how natural killers work. Okay, inflammation. Um, so we tend to demonize inflammation. We're always trying to avoid inflammation. But really, inflammation is an important part of our immune response. We only don't want inflammation if it's happening when it shouldn't be. So if we have inflammation somewhere where there shouldn't be inflammation or it's lasting longer than we want it to, that's a problem. And that's what we want to avoid. But in general, inflammation is a good thing. So if we have an injury, so we have some kind of damage to a tissue or a cut or whatever it might be, some kind of tissue damage, or we might have some kind of uh, infection, some kind of microbe that's causing trouble, our response is to send more blood flow to that area. And that's great. That's the best response possible in that case, because we're sending oxygen and nutrients that are going to help those cells fight that infection or heal and repair in the case of tissue damage. Um, and it's sending platelets, which are important for our blood clotting. So if there is tissue damage, we want to clot so that we're not just bleeding. We don't want to just keep bleeding. So we send more blood there with more platelets to prevent that bleeding. It's also carrying white blood cells. It's in carrying important immune cells to help us protect against infection. Um, so that's what inflammation is. And that's why inflammation causes redness, pain, heat, and swelling. It's because of the blood flow that's going to that area. So if we have tissue damage, we have an injury, we have infection, inflammation is a great thing because it's going to help heal and protect us. Now, it's when that inflammation goes on too long or too extreme or it shouldn't have happened in the first place that it's a problem. Um, and so then we want to address whatever caused that inflammation uh, so that that inflammation can go down. All right, a fever. Uh, is an abnormally high body temperature. We've always, we've all had a fever. We all know what it, that's like. Um, it can be caused by infection or inflammation or both. Um, in some cases, the high body temperature can actually inhibit the growth of the microbe that you're trying to fight against. Uh, but in a lot of cases, the high body temperature doesn't really matter to the virus or whatever it is that we're fighting. And the purpose of the fever in that case is that it speeds up your metabolic rate. Um, so when I talk about metabolism or metabolic rate, what I'm really referring to is the rate at which we have chemical reactions taking place in the body. So the, the speed of all the building up and breaking down that our body is doing just on a daily basis to complete all of its cellular activities. So that could be producing proteins or hormones or doing whatever it's got to do, whatever the cells have to do. As a general rule, the higher our body temperature is, the faster the rate of all those chemical reactions. So when we're sick, it's to our benefit 
for all those chemical reactions to happen more quickly because it means that we're going to be producing immune cells faster and and doing all the different things faster that's going to help us heal and recover and repair um, and so we have a fever when we're sick, but we also can induce that same effect by just elevating our body temperature. It's one of the many benefits of exercise is that we are increasing body temperature, which has that effect of increasing metabolic rate. Also things like hot showers and baths and sauna, steam room, hot weather, anything that's elevating your body temperature is also speeding your metabolism for that time. Uh, not necessarily ongoingly after your your temperature is back to normal, but for the time and usually for a, a brief span afterwards, then you're going to have a faster metabolic rate. Uh, also, fever, anytime you have a higher body temperature, it also has your body producing what are called heat shock proteins. Um, so heat shock proteins are awesome little proteins that help you heal and repair and do all kinds of really great things in your body. There are many different types that do many different things. And so when we have a higher body temperature, we're also producing heat shock proteins, which are really great for us, which again, we can induce that um, with exercise, sauna, steam room, all those sorts of, of different things that increase our body temperature. All right. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.